only several million years ago, the fluid magma of the Himalayas became solid and formed this stone. It's a granite. It has some quartz and small black speckles. The Sherpas traditionally carve out spiritual messages in stone and they use the sturdy granite as a building material. So I asked the builder to give me his best mason. His name is Zibi. I first asked Zibi for a single curved stone. That was okay. Then a double curved stone. That was a challenge. But he managed to chisel this out of a raw piece of granite. Sagamata next is situated at 3800 meters altitude, just above Namche Bazar, the last larger town on the way to Everest Base Camp. The open landscape is stunningly beautiful. Turquoise and yellow dotted meadows are mixed with outstretched poles of drooping juniper trees and rhododendron. While clouds are rolling in, raptors glide overhead. Yaks freely roam around, carefully picking out the juiciest grasses and the tastiest herbs. Everything is moving. At Sustainable Mountain Architecture, we normally design with nature. For Sagamata Next, we first designed with the wind. Carefully curved shapes of the interpretation center and the workshop deflect the strong mountain gusts. Together with the south-facing cafe, the buildings form the Langang Square. Langang is the flat area in front of a traditional Sherpa house. Here you can rest and recuperate. Drink some water. Orientate yourself. It is a pause point. Enjoy the cafe and visit the workshop where waste is being upcycled. The interpretation center will provide insight and knowledge for you. Local school children are most welcome. For the interpretation center, the, uh, the walls that we designed are curved. And that means that if the walls are curved and also the roof is curved, you end up with a very sharp point this one which might be a little bit aggressive so we tested it out and we thought that if we do a double swallow tail by slightly cutting back the front part it becomes very elegant once the full set of detailed drawings by the Sustainable Mountain Architecture team was completed, the first full loop of creating architecture was made. Next was the construction process, the challenge of the actual making of the buildings. Together, these two loops make 720 degrees of architecture. As architects, our team took time to explain the design of the buildings to the Sherpas. We wanted to find a local builder. News spread fast and everybody wanted to see what the project was about. Yes, everybody. After two years of preparation, we finally could do the setting out. Together with the builder, Chiring Sherpa. The foundations could be made just before the long winter set in. In a cold climate, in an earthquake zone, a well-balanced mud mortar is best. For a perfect mud mortar, all the ingredients need to come together. Yellow deep soil, yak dung from Kumjung, eggshells from the Namche Bazaar bakeries. Local material is the future.
to bind the mix, I asked Chiring for mustard oil. After two days, he came to me with a big smile. He had found a small bottle and I could make the perfect mud mortar. Over lunch, I asked him, where did he find it? Oh, stole it from my sister. She uses the mustard oil for her hair. Time for a break. Time for Su Chia. Made by our cook Dan, the mixed Sherpa Rai Tamang building crew all enjoy this heavy tea. The horizontal timber bands in the wall have a function. They make the buildings earthquake resistant. In the third building season, we reached the roof level. The heavy lunch made by Dan provides new energy needed to lift the 500 kg truss beams into their positions. 45 of them. The design of the walls and the windows welcome the energy of the morning sun. For the interiors, we design two series of yak wool curtains. We choose to use a variety of patterns in several natural colors to celebrate the local skills. A century ago, Rabindranath Tagore from Bengal described what goes beyond the bricks and the mortar. In his book Creative Unity, he talks about the soul of a building. For the local children, it is an exciting day trip. For you, it is hopefully a life-changing pause point. From an Himalayan bird's eye perspective, it is just a dot in the landscape. Good morning, everybody. I. Uh This is what I call slow architecture. In the department of uh, food, we have already found out that slow food is much better than fast food. Um, I hope that slow science and slow uh, research and slow uh, approach of, uh, of things, uh, they normally last longer. Uh, you have a beautiful word for it, it's called tikau. Um, so I deeply believe in that. Um, I need to thank a bucket of people, but I also have only 22 minutes left. Um, thank you, Sarala uh, and the Gang Talk uh, office. Um, thank you, organizing committee. I would really like an applause for the organizers of this event. <laughs> Super good. Uh, from uh, Ashmita to Mr. Putula to the insect uh, cookies. Uh, excellent. Uh, of course, I was lucky to have a nice conversation with Professor Baba yesterday um, and, uh, and the opening speech of Saraj was, uh, I thought, really, really good to hear something about socially just conservation. Um, my friend Sachin uh, gave me another quote. He said, environmentalism without class struggle is just gardening. And I thought that was a great quote. I don't know whose quote it is, but thank you, Sachin. Sachin Sumati, my wife Anohita, uh, Ankita, uh, Kartik, uh, where to start? Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm also very pleased to have the, uh, the deputy Dutch uh, consul in, uh, in, our, uh, in our midst, uh, Mr. Heine. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm, I'm Dutch, so if you want to recognize Dutch or Danish people, you just look above six feet and then 
the chances are there that we are that. Um, I'm going to go to my presentation in uh, Max uh, Verstappen Formula One style. I need to go fast. Um, I'm not so comfortable here, so I'm just going to walk around. Um, I've called my lecture uh, Equipose, to find a balance of things. And cities are very complex uh, entities. Once upon a time, cities were solutions. If you have a beautiful voice, I'm, I, I, uh, I sing like a crow, but if you have a beautiful voice, you can sing in the field and birds can enjoy how you sing. But if you're in a city and you have an audience, they can enjoy it. So the city is a solution. If you have agricultural produce and you would like to sell that, you come to the market and people buy it. So the city is a solution. If you have a meeting, you need to take a decision about something, and people gather in the city to do that. Again, the city is a solution. Today, we only talk about problems when we talk about cities. There's a problem with pollution, there's a problem with water, there's a problem with traffic. Everything related to cities seems to be a problem. So what went wrong? These guys, This is the um, Kabul Children's uh, Circus. The guy with the green shirt can only do what he does because of his friends. So if you work with something complex, you need to get a momentum. You need to start something and you need to get it going. You need to find right partners. I'm just one guy. On my own, there's very little I can do. But if you have a team, if you have people from different disciplines and you can collaborate, and bring together things. Um, am I supposed to do the next slide, or can you do that? Do you have a remote? It's there? Oh, it's okay. I just didn't see it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So this little girl, huh, she gets it going. And look at her face, how concentrated she is to keep it going. If you look at cities, also sometimes you have explosions of growth. If you think that Shanghai is a fast growing city, or maybe even people have been complaining Bangalore is growing so fast. Kabul in Afghanistan grew with over 600%. It's a ridiculous growth much more than the African cities. That's how it looks like. So after the 25 years of struggle, so many Afghans came back to the capital because where they used to live, they could not return to that place. And the city is also a place of promise, of opportunity, of jobs, of big money, etc., etc. And so the aspiration to go to the city. So it's not a beautiful Kabul anymore. Anamita and me, we spent seven and a half years in Afghanistan. It's not that little fortress, the Balahisar, with a few mountains and then the Kabul River and then you have a kebab, etc., etc. It looks a little different. This is in the 70s where you can already see the old city and the new parts of the city coming up. It was growing steadily. There was some sort of a plan. Today, if you look especially and the planned city is in the foreground, that is called Sharanau. But if you look at the back of the slide, I don't know if I have a pointer. So this is the planned city. But if you go towards the hills, once upon a time there were trees. Everything got cut down. And people are building. Building like mad. No water, no electricity, no sewage, and a winter that normally goes down to minus 15. Good luck with the quality of life. And it's urban sprawl. It goes on and on and on and on. 
rather conservative people in Afghanistan who are quite clear about their privacy. So what do you do if you have this way of things? They literally paint their windows. Can you believe that? <laughs> so this is the opinion of the local guys. So let's go to Nepal. Ramro Cha. Beautiful Nepal, poetic, the mountains, the big Himalayas, etc. Where traditionally people built on the tar, the higher area, and they do their agriculture in the dole, the lower area. Makes sense in terms of clay, in terms of flooding, in terms of whatever. That's not happening anymore. This is Kirtipur in the Kathmandu Valley. Utter madness in earthquake zone number five. What's going wrong, guys, with our cities? And this addiction to concrete. People just love cement. Linear development, yeah? I'm not so much into politics, but it seems to be that linear development is really, really doing well. You only look at your GDP and how many cube meters of concrete you use. And if that's really high or going up, you can say, we are developing, man. This is, uh, I should have quoted or credited the NASA. This is a picture of uh, it's not some strange new coronavirus. It's, it's the city of Kathmandu spreading out. So, this is the Department of Problems. Let's have a look at solutions. Because I am pragmatic and I love solutions. And I think uh, I was trained in Delft University. And uh, you can complain, you can have sob stories, etc. But trying to find solutions. And solution is a very uh, pretentious word. So I prefer to say suggestion or scenario that might be better alternative to, uh, to the existing. This was done for the IMI, the Mountain Initiative of India, PD Rai, and. Uh, a lot of other people, all the mountain states came together and they asked us to make a vision for Mosuri in 2040. How many of you have been in Mosuri? Yeah. So it's a quaint town, but it's also, there are some challenges. So you start doing your homework, or you at A3 you would probably call it research. So there is a bit of growth, not so crazy as Kathmandu. Uh, they have 25-30% of growth of the people who live in Mosuri. But Mosuri doubles up with visitors. When you went to Mosuri, you also were eating and drinking and using the bathroom. So Mosuri, during a couple of months, the population actually doubles. And that's important to know, because the calculations that are normally made are made based on the population. They don't take in account, if you have a plot and you have a house and you have a single family, that's very different than a four-story hotel. Your consumption and your sewerage and your etc., your footprint is much higher. And so the floating population in the peak season is seriously almost doubling up the challenges of Mosuri. And then how much land do you actually have? So if you take the simple rule, they've done it pretty well in Goa, of if the slope is more than 30%, it doesn't make sense to build there. So you exclude it from what you would say a buildable area. I, of course, am not the biggest fan of GCBs. I design with the contours. But if it's more than 
with the beautiful monsoons that you have, it's advisable in general not to build there. So you can see that the amount of land in Mosuri is 80% that you cannot use. Uh, 11 square kilometers is already built. So you basically have very little land where you can actually build on. But if you have impatient capitals from guys from Gurgaon and Noida and Delhi Wallas who think that they know everything because they have money, they go to the hills and they said, uh, we want to have a nice house here. It's a bit, maybe we can level it. Yeah? It's literally that kind of stupid level of thinking, I would say. It's just me, myself, and I. There's no bigger context. India is not an exception. It happens in many places in the world. Ah, good morning, Mr. Baba. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, we did our homework. I will not go into details. I don't have the time for it. And mapping. Mapping is important. We, in the Netherlands, we plan out every square centimeter for the coming 30 years, because we don't have so many square centimeters. We use mapping as a device. Uttrakhand map, the geology, uh, the geology map. And this is all available by the government. This is the slope of the maps. And if you then start combining the slopes and the watersheds, you see that there is not so much left. So when you see a map for a lot of people, including government uh, 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 people, etc., who, who take decisions, who make policies, etc., they find it really difficult to read maps. So we believe that model making, 3D model making, is something that is easier to understand for a large amount of people. We had people who lived in Masuri for 30 years, and when they saw this 3D model, they said, actually, this is the first time that I understand my own town. Because you never see it like that. And if you want to look at possible future scenarios, you need to start conversations. So we presented this at the June University with a fantastic guy who's not there anymore, Mr. Tolia. And it was really, really engaging to have the feedbacks, etc. So, for instance, Mosuri is on a hill, right? You have sewerage. Sewerage will always go down. There's a guy called Mr. Newton. Can we use the sewerage going down to actually make energy? Not so difficult, huh? And it's done 20 years ago in California. They've already done it. It's not rocket science. So you need to show by simple means, I think, how, what, what would be possible scenarios to do it differently. Four dimensions, meaning X, Y, and Z. And of course, the fourth dimension is time. Because to make something is not so difficult. How does it perform? How does it work after 10, 20, 30, 50 years? So we took very simple starting points. We said mountain, town, you need to have clean air. If you don't have clean air, you can't maybe call it a mountain town. Smart water, I think there are far more professional people in the water department here, so. I will keep that short. An organic city. I read in the newspaper today that Bangalore single-use plastic is not doing very well. But you have to try it. You have to kind of see if it can be more organic. Walkable city. More walking, healthier. Manage your waste, manage your sewage, etc. Smart water organic city maybe maybe and by going to 2040 you also have people who think uh, hmm, not sure if I'm still around that's a good thing 
it releases you from your personal attachment to whatever you want to influence. Think a little bit further in time and then work your way back. You figured out scenarios for 2050, 40. You go back 2035, 2030, and then you come towards the Department of Solutions. So maybe this is the question. How do we prevent urban sprawl? Because urban sprawl is something nobody loves. In Delhi, big city, we were working for about three years with IIT Delhi, with SPA, with some Dutch government people who are very good in planning uh, to rethink, fundamentally th rethink the capital of India. Heat islands, in the same day, this is IIT and uh, Tokyo University, three years of research, but they had not published it. They kept it for themselves. We said, can we, can we use it? And then graphically, we made it more interesting. So heat islands, on the same day, in the same time in Delhi, if you have a place where you have tarmac, you have buildings with air conditioning, you have uh, concrete, uh, etc. As compared to a place that is, we just passed the Sanki tank there, beautiful, lovely water, trees, canopy, etc., etc. The temperature difference in Delhi on that same day is 8.1 degrees. And my time is up. I'll just go through some of the graphics. So what happens in Delhi in one day? You can do this for Bangalore. Look at the amount of traffic accidents. Look at the amount of 40,000 cows on the road. And if the stars are aligned, 36,000 people get married. So this is a different way of mapping your city. Four thinking models. I hope I can have another three minutes. Yeah. Not this kind of models, these beautiful guys and ladies, but this kind of models. Habitat. Habitat is actually where you look at the network, the public transportation network that can deal with the numbers. Yeah? If I go to my friends in Amsterdam and New York, I don't have a car. But if you would tell them that you have a car, they said, oh, you, have a, you have a car? Really? No. You, you have a car? My God, there's something wrong with you. Huh? Because it uh, guzzles up uh, petrol and it stinks and it needs maintenance and you need to pay tax and those kind of things. Who wants to own a car? We used recycled material. I saw a nice stand here of the Bangalore upcycle people who use electronic waste. Culture loop is that you say, um, who's visiting Delhi because Delhi is such a nice city? Hardly anybody. You go to Delhi for education, for tax, for a job or whatever, but not to enjoy Delhi. So if you spend 30 years on making the eight historic cities of Delhi a fantastic place, people will actually come to Delhi to enjoy the city, which is not happening now. Urban harvest, typically an A3 scenario, I would say. Harvest the sun, harvest the water, uh, put it back into the grid. And Life Street, this is Jane Jacobs, uh, where most of the cities, and I would very much include um, pockmarked, Bangalore, they look at the buildings. They don't look at the space between the buildings. So if I can choose <coughs> for a city that has a fantastic streets, fantastic parks, fantastic pavements, and okay buildings, or you have very fancy buildings, and you have horrible streets, horrible public streets, I would choose for the first one. It gives a higher quality of life, in my mind. 
We used upcycled material. I don't know if uh, your auntie broke her hip recently, but it could be one of these uh, x-ray pictures of the model. So don't use new material. There is already so much material. If you build models as architects or whatever, use existing material. Be creative. Lots of dialogues. And then we said, um, how do we bring this to the people? How do we... We literally put the big models that we made on carts and we rolled it through Delhi. Fantastic. So these guys, they're not PhD students. They don't have a lot of education. They are not intelligent people or whatever we call it. But they have IDs and they are scared of what is happening to the city. These ladies said, why don't you send this to the Biennale, in uh, the Architectural Biennale. This is a very interesting methodology of using physical architectural models to depict possible future scenarios. So we did it, we got selected. 26 projects were selected, one from uh, South Asia, that was uh, Delhi 2050. Many houses do not make a city. Maybe we should tell that to the real estate developers here. Thank you so much. Daniel Bada.